So just before we broke for lunch, uh, I was asked about um, how intent modifies um, our reality, and particularly within the, uh, uh, the context of, what is it called, the secret, or um, yeah, law of attraction, programming the universe, and lots of ways that people talk about that. Well, the way that works is that in this virtual reality, we have uh, databases that keep track of what's going on, what's likely to go on, what has gone on. Okay, that's, this is a information system. Consciousness is an information system. So it's all about information. And information systems are systems of data and systems of processing and systems of storage. So the system needs the past information because it's past is a good learning tool. It's hard to learn anything if you, know, you don't have any sense of the past or you don't have any record of the past. Everything's kind of new and you keep reinventing that same wheel over and over and over again. So the past is neat for that. And it also has to uh, keep track of what is likely to happen. Because in creating a virtual reality, you have to compute it. And in order to compute it, it sure is handy if you have some idea what it is you're going to have to compute so that you can get ready for that and be prepared for that. It makes the, the computing a lot more efficient. So we need, the, uh, we need these databases and there's some more fundamental needs for them besides the ones I've just mentioned, but that's easy enough to understand. So we have a probable future database and in the probable future database, it's just what is possible and the probability of that possibility actually being actualized. So what could happen and what's the probability that it will happen? That's the future probable database. Now, don't confuse that with predestination. There is free will and that future is only a probable future. And as we make different choices here, those probabilities change. Okay, so the probabilities are very much in flux all the time. Some probabilities are more stable than others. Some where there's lots of uncertainty, well, the probability could move through all of that space created by the uncertainty. Places where there's very little uncertainty, then those are things that uh, they, they stay probable maybe for a long time. So in our environment, there's much uncertainty. Now, one of the feedback mechanisms of this virtual reality is that we get to influence what we end up with. We get to influence the, the result. We get to influence this reality. So partly we are creators of this reality that we're in. And we do that creation process multiple ways. And one of the ways is that our intent modifies future probability. So if we have an intent for something to be a particular way, it's more likely it will be that way. That's why we were talking earlier about fear. If you are fearful, you will most always act in ways to manifest that fear. Okay? And a short way to say that is you create what you fear. So if you're very fearful, we can make an example, if you're very fearful of uh, people not liking you, then that fear will be projected out in ego of either being very withdrawn or being very belligerent. Not necessarily belligerent, but being very much out there. Okay. So that fear then creates those things and those conditions, of course, is makes it more likely that people actually won't like you because you're either in their face or you don't interact with them. So you, you do those things. You act in ways that manifest your fears into this reality. Well, that's just your intent 
modifying future probability. If you're very positive, that works too. What you are positive about, if you're a very up person, you're always kind of happy and everything is good, you're optimistic and you have this real positive attitude, and that's not just an act, that's you, down at the being level, very positive, you'll find out that your life tends to be very positive because you create that also for yourself. So that's one way that we create our, our reality here, our intents change future probability. That's how healing works. That's why you're able to use your mind to change an effect in someone's health. And of all the things that you can do with your mind that are easy, that beginners can do, they don't take a lot of, diff you know, not very hard, they're very simple things to do, healing is probably the easiest thing that you can do. The reason for that is that health has a lot of uncertainty around it. Your state of health is always uncertain. Even things that seem like uh, they're, they're very certain, in health, you never know what's gonna happen. Somebody that's given three weeks to live, two weeks later, doesn't have the disease anymore. Well, it doesn't happen a lot, but it happens, you see. So the fact that it happens at all means there's uncertainty as to what will happen. Now, if you have that lump and you know, five doctors have biopsied it and they all say that it's malignant and very aggressive and you know, there's no help, well, now there's less uncertainty than, when, than before when all that knowledge was out there. Okay, because now you have a bunch of doctors and all the people you told are all feeling terribly sorry for you and everybody else thinking very negatively about the awful thing that's gonna happen, you know, that sort of thing. And all that negativity makes it a lot more likely that it will happen. And those places where people suddenly get better are the ones where somebody just had a total change of attitude. Completely changed the way they see the world and then it just, that changes. So healing is an artifact of us being able to modify future probability. The placebo effect, everybody's familiar with that. That's an effect where if you think something is going to hurt you or help you, either one, then it does. And it's not just that it makes you think it will, but it really does. So the placebo effect is real medicine. It's not fake imaginary medicine, it really works. Something like 35 or 40% of all the people given a placebo do physically get better. Not just feel better or think they're better, they get better. And uh, we have to beat that placebo effect with our medicines before generally we can sell them. That's a, that's a uh, demonstrate their efficacy. Otherwise, the medicine, if it isn't any better than the placebo effect, then we think, well, that's really not very good medicine. So that's one of the tests that pharmaceuticals have to pass to get their products out there is to beat the placebo effect. So there's a, a psi effect. There's a paranormal effect that's part of our law. So anyway, the way this, the... Uh, the uh, law of attraction works is if you do put an intent into things happening or being a certain way, you do indeed raise the probability for those things happening. Now, it doesn't mean that you will make them happen. It just means you will raise the probability of those things happening. And the more effort and the more, the more intent, the more focused intent, then the more you will change the probability. So let's say we start with something that is very improbable, say one in a million to happen. That's its probability now, there's one in a million. Well, with good intent and focus, we might change that to one in a thousand. That's a lot of change. We've just changed it through, you know, multiple orders of magnitude, but probably still no banana. It's probably still not likely to happen even though we've changed it that much. And why would it be one in a million? because there's not much uncertainty. You see, one in a million means there's very little uncertainty with that. Well, the amount of uncertainty with a, around a situation is what you need to 
be able to change it. So let's say the situation is, you know, 50-50 or 40-60 or something like that. Well, now that's something that's much easier to change because you have a lot of uncertainty to work with. Okay, so that's just the, just the fundamentals of what your attitude, what your intent does to modify your, your reality. Okay, now, all intents, all intents are not equal. An intent needs to be focused. That's one thing. If it's just, oh, I put a penny in the wishing well and I wish for, you know, uh, good things and prosperity, that's a very weak intent. It's not a strong, it's not a focused intent. Okay, so intents are different than, than wishes. Intents are something that you must focus clearly. That's why people who uh, are good at using their intent to modify things aren't just making wishes. They get into an altered state. They let go of what's going on here, you know, like we call it point consciousness. They focus in on what the, the subject is and they keep that focus tight for as much time as they've got to do that. And then an hour or two later, they'll do it again. And then, you know, two or three hours later, they do it again. And eventually they can do it very quickly because it's just what I said before, you know, more of the same. And that doesn't take them very long. They can drop in and out of the states to do that very quickly. So that's what I mean by focused intent. You have to get rid of all the noise, all the monkey mind, tell the intellect to be quiet and you have to focus your awareness on that result. The second thing that's important is that that focusing has to be at the being level. It needs to come out of your heart. It needs to come out of what's inside of you. Now we have an intellectual level and a being level. A being level is who and what you are at the core of you. Not who you'd like to be, not who you think you are, but who you really are at your core. That's your being level. And if your intent comes from the being level, then it's much more powerful than if it's intellectual. It's coming from the intellectual level. The intellectual level puts it almost back in the wish category. It's still an intent, and it still does a little bit, but it just doesn't have the strength behind it to move the probability very much. So those are the two keys. And uh, a little interesting story about that that you'll probably find amusing is that in pair labs, where they used focused intent to modify the outcome mostly of statistical distribution. So they'd get a random number generator and then they'd have people with their minds bias that random number generator to one side or the other. So let's say it made random numbers between, you know, zero and 10 and if you just let the random numbers run between zero and 10, you'll get a five as an average. Well, you can have people with their intent make that average be a 4.8 or a 5.2 or something like that just because they intend it to be that way. Okay, now that is another psi effect, right? Using intent, something that shouldn't happen. Intent shouldn't make a difference about how random number generators work. So anyway, this has been studied a long time. And one of the interesting things they found is that the males that they had were probably, you know, 80 or 90 percent accurate about making that little um, difference in the median move either, say, to higher, slightly higher numbers or slightly lower numbers, either way. So their target would be, here's a random number generator. We want the, we want the average to come up higher than the five. We want it to get bigger, to the high side. And the men would work at it, and it almost always they could uh, individually or in a group make it go to the high side. And if asked to make it go to the low side, they almost always made it go to the low side. But they only made it go uh, just a little bit. So instead of a, a five, it was just a 5.1 or 5.08 or something, enough to be statistic statistically significant but not a lot. When they had the ladies do it, they found that it was, a, it was a wild guess which way it would go. 
it could go up, it could go down, and there was no really way of telling which way the thing would go. But when they moved it, it moved by a lot. Okay, so they would make it go instead of a five, it'd come out a six or a 5.9 or a 6.2, but it might just as likely have been a 4.2 a 4 or something else. They weren't very good about making it go the right way, but what they did was bigger. Well, why was that? They wondered what was the difference between males and females that made it work that way. The difference was that the men were very focused on the task of doing it just right, and they were mostly left brain because that's the way they are, and they always made it go in the right direction, but they were working from their intellect more than they were from their being level. The ladies weren't as focused on exactly what they were doing, but they were doing it all from the being level, not from the intellectual level, so they made it move more, you see? So that's that's a kind of an interesting story, a little bit of between how men and women you know, process their world a little differently. Women tend to process it more from the core, less from the intellect, and men tend to process, process it more from the intellect and less from the core. So that's important that your, that your intent comes from the heart, from the being level, not you're doing this because it's what you're supposed to be doing. That intellect uh, is a weak leader. Okay. So that's the idea with, uh, with intent and changing probability. But while we're on the subject, there's a couple of other ways you make this reality. Another way that you create this reality is by your interpretation of the data you get. So you get information and you have to interpret it. How you interpret it depends on your past history, all your past experience, all your past knowledge, your fear, your ego, your love, all of that makes you, it goes into how you interpret that message. So you may hear some words and let's say, um, I don't know, I'll make something up. Let's say somebody just tells you, wow, the sky sure is blue today. And if you're really, really uh, insecure, you may think, wow, they had to tell me that because they didn't think I could figure that out, uh, you know, and that would bother you and it'd feel like an insult. And somebody else would think, uh, yeah, it really is, it's gonna be a great day. And you see, you make a difference about how you interpret things. Everybody helps create their own reality because they interpret the data. That's why five people standing on a street corner turn in five different accident reports when they all saw the same two cars run into each other. Because every one of it puts their own spin on it from their own, their own knowledge base, their own experience base. Okay, so that's two ways. Now what that means is, is that we're all living in our own reality. None of us share this reality exactly. Everybody's walking around in their own personal reality. And we're all have intents, and these intents are modifying whether we mean to or not. They are modifying future probability. Maybe not strongly, but they're all modifying future probability. And my intents, I'm trying to move it to the right, and your intents, you're trying to move it to the left. And we have all this stuff going on with all seven and a half billion of us on this planet. We're all, you know, we're all doing this all the time, whether we know it or not. And we're interpreting everything in our own way. So there isn't just one reality that we live in and we all share. There are parts of it that we share, but mostly we live in our own, in our own reality that we create. Uh, another interesting thing about this is that because we live in our own reality and the nature of the way reality works is that you can never directly share an experience. Every one of your experiences are yours and yours alone. You can describe an experience and the other person will take that data and interpret it however they do. But you can't actually let anybody else know what you're experiencing directly. Every experience you have is personal and stays that way. Now, if you're really good at describing it, and they're really good at interpreting it, it might get close, but it's still 
you, de you have to describe it in the metaphors and symbols that you're familiar with. They have to interpret it in the metaphors and symbols that they're familiar with in their database. So we have two different databases, one describing in terms of theirs, the other one interpreting in terms of theirs, and that's as close as you're ever going to get to sharing any experience that you've ever had. So, see, it's us. We're in here in our own reality. And what we're supposed to be doing is making choices for the right reasons. It's our intent is what's important. Not so much what we do, but our intention of why we're doing it. That's where the, it's either toward love or it's toward fear it comes in, is in that intent. Okay, so that was, that was on, that, on that subject we had. So now we'll, we'll start again. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, just going back to the, uh, the intent thing. Um, is that, is this where collapsing the way comes in? Just to touch on the quantum physics a little bit. Um, what I understood from what you said is that you have an intent to go to the void mm -hmm. with this. Uh, it's not where the concept comes from, but it's, um, it may be an appropriate metaphor in some ways, because what happens is what we experience, okay, if we experience some objective fact here, okay, it's, if it's in a fact like it's a shared, it's a shared fact, like this, this little microphone here that's picking up audio, okay, well, everybody can see it, right, so we all see more or less the same thing, even though it's personal, what each of us sees and what we make of that and what we thought of it. Um, I don't know, that might help a little bit. Anyway, that would be a shared element, okay? And we're all gonna pretty much agree on what it is for two reasons. One, all of our sensors are pretty much the same. We all see in the same frequency. You know, we don't, some of us see in ultraviolet and some of us see in infrared. We all see about the same frequencies. And we've all learned up, we've all learned through our experience to put labels on those things. This is black, right? We all kind of agree it's black, even though every one of us sees a little different color there because our physiology is not exactly the same. But we've all learned that whatever that is that we see, that's what we call black or at least that's what it, most of us call it. So we agree on that. Part of it's socialization, part of it is that our, our sensory apparatus is all very similar, all pretty much in the same range. The other part of it is culturally. If we all come from the same culture, and we've all seen digital microphones before, you know, it's just, everybody looks at that and says, oh yeah, look, that's a microphone, you know, it's recording this audio. So we, we kind of come to that conclusion because it's a cultural thing that we're, aware, that we're aware of. If somebody came in here that you plucked up out of the rainforest jungle someplace that had never seen anything electronic in their life, they'd have no idea what that is. Maybe they'd think it was some kind of spider with you know, blue legs. They wouldn't know, they would have no concept with it. So they would interpret it very differently. But we interpret things very much alike because we have similar culture, we have similar sensors, and you know, we uh, have a similar uh, experience basis. So that's why it looks like we all live in the same reality. We don't really. And if you were to transport yourself back with that person in a little uh, you know, tribal culture in the Amazon someplace, we just plucked him out to see if he knew what that was, if you went back there with him, and lived in his culture for a bit, you'd realize that his reality wasn't anything at all like yours. It was just totally different. You, you know, the things that they knew about and the things that they saw and how they interpreted was just completely different to you. So that's just the nature of reality. It's personal. It's not really a shared objective place. In other words, reality is subjective and it's subjective all the time. There is no objective reality. You know, science only studies the objective reality. There really is no objective reality. It doesn't exist. All reality is subjective. All consciousness is subjective. 
what they're doing is they're studying a reality where the uncertainty is small, but it's still there. Everything has some uncertainty around it. Okay, there isn't anything that isn't some uncertain, even if it's this thing. We can weigh that, and it'll be a certain number of grams to six decimal places, and somebody else will weigh it, and it's a different number down in the last two decimal places. Depends on their equipment, depends on air currents maybe, you know, but we can refine it as much as you like, but eventually you run out of decimal places. That means the uncertainty is in those decimal places that you can't measure. We don't know what they are. So see, everything has uncertainty. When the uncertainty is real small, like how much that weighs, well, we call that objective, but it's not really. It's just that the uncertainty, the subjective component of that is just tiny. So our, our world is not an objective world. It's not really a shared world at the detail level. Okay, so that's a, yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, some of those experiments, and I will get back to your, to your question. Some of those experiments are have a, have a computer with a thousand pictures in it. Some of them terribly ugly, some of them nice and pleasing. Okay. Have a random number generator decide which picture you're going to show the subject. Okay, so the random number generator will pick a number from one to a thousand and that's the picture they'll pick out. That's what they'll put on the screen in front of the subject. Wire up the subject so that you can tell really minute potentials going on in muscle tissue and other places and you will find that the subject will begin to react to the content of the picture before the random number generator has even decided which one of those pictures it's going to pull. So the random number generator say one second before the picture is shown decides, makes a random pull from one to a thousand to pull a picture. And two seconds or three seconds before that picture is shown, random number hasn't even come out yet, the person starts to react to the picture that's going to be shown. Okay, now how does that, how does that work? And that's been done with lots of different kinds of experiments. Okay. And people have taken that to prove that there is no free will, you see. It's all programmed. We don't have any free choice. That picture is going to be an ugly one and we'll have ugly reaction or it's going to be a happy one and we'll have a happy reaction. And that's going to happen uh, anyway. It's programmed, predestination, no free will. But that's not at all what's going on. That's not at all what's going on. We do have free will. And there's a few things going on here now. One, you have to realize there's another actor in this game, and that actor is the larger consciousness system. You'll also have to realize that that computer is just like your avatar. It's just a virtual computer in this virtual world, also generated by the larger consciousness system. Okay, so the larger consciousness system knows, one, what's coming up and what's the probability of what's coming up and so on because it's generated the computer, it's generated the building you're sitting in, it's all a virtual reality, it's all computed. And what's going to happen next we have is probable reality, right? So it's not that it's really so unknown. Even if you have a radioactive element and you're letting its decay trigger the random numbers. Well, that's not just pseudo random numbers like they come, got usually out of a computer. These are real, you know, random numbers comes out of a decay of an element. Guess what? That's a virtual element. That's decaying virtual particles that are picked up by a virtual uh, detector. All of it's computed. It's all just virtual physical stuff. Well, there's a computer's computing all of that. So one, it's not like the larger system is not, you know, understanding what's, what's happening, the likelihood of what's happening, 
and all the rest of it because it's generating all of that. It's generating that radioactive source. Just like it generates this body and the pictures and the screen that it's going to be shown on. So that's one thing. Second thing is the way this reality works is that we evolved to be like this, to have this form, you know, two legs, two arms, opposable thumbs, all the rest of it just came up out of the simulation. I think we talked about this this morning. It was the, you know, the digital bang. So we evolved this way. Our consciousness, which is calling all the shots and having us do whatever we do, making all the choices, okay, our consciousness is very, very fast. It computes very quickly. Okay. This body is stuck with the, if you want to call it that, the analog form of the rule set, right? The rule set, how energy is exchanged, ended up evolving to be this, okay? Those are electromechanical processes. When I move a muscle, there has to be a, you know, there has to be charge down the nerve, which affects some sort of chemical, which tells the muscle to get ready to contract. And, it's a long, slow process because of the rule set. It's just the way our rule set works here. Now, you know if you've played video games, there's a thing called video lag. Video lag is when <laughs> your elf is in trouble and you tell him to run away, but he doesn't get the message because your signal is lagging in the system. It takes a while before you're your, your uh, internet company gets your signal out there and it takes a while before then the computer sends it to your elf to tell him to run away. Meanwhile, your, your elf just stands there like an idiot, not moving because he's not getting any instructions because of video lag and yeah, the, you know, the barbarian you know, gives him a hard time. So you're swearing and shouting because I told him to run, I told him to run, but he didn't move. That's video lag and the video lag can be that way coming back where the computer's already done some action and you're sitting there looking at your screen and nothing's happening because it takes a long time for your computer to actually get the signal and then give it to you. So video lag works in both directions and it makes things almost impossible to work. How can you play the game if you say it to do something and it doesn't happen? So then you tell them to do it again and do it again and it still doesn't happen and then it happens three times. You know? because it's the first time and the other two and, and things are going. You just can't play in a, in a coherent game that has much video lag. Well, here we are with a fast consciousness and a really slow electrochemical avatar. And the avatar can't do any better than that because that's the rule set that created this physical universe, evolved this body. So what do we do? We try to get rid of the video lag. Well, what do we do? What does the larger conscious system do? It tries to get rid of the video lag. It knows that when that picture comes up ugly and that person goes oh, like that because it's a really nasty picture, that takes time. First, you gotta have electrical signals in the brain and the eye vision, and it goes down to the vision centers. They have to interpret it against history. They decide that it's ugly. Then they gotta send a message down to the muscle. The muscle has to begin to create ions. Those ions have to transfer through some tissue. They have to tell the muscle to begin to contract. And you've got all of this stuff going on that gives you terrible video lag. So the system, just in general, when it knows, because it's, in, it's running the whole simulation that you're going to have an ugly picture to respond to instead of the ugly picture coming up and you're just sitting there for, you know, a couple of seconds and then going, oh, you know, well, that's video lag. You get the response afterwards, you know, and that makes the whole reality kind of clumsy. So instead, it starts those electrochemical potentials moving ahead of time so that when the picture comes up, you respond. Now we have a nice smooth reality that we can all function in well. So that's where that particular process, you know, why, it, why it's like that. It's not that we don't have free will. It's that our bodies are slow 
And otherwise, we'd be living in a world where we couldn't have jet planes because nobody would have good, good enough reaction time. We wouldn't be very good at even driving cars because we wouldn't be able to re respond well enough in our cars because something would get in front of us and we just kind of stare off into space like nothing happened until then it was too late. And then we decided it was time to put our foot on the, on the brake. Video lag creates a lot of problems, particularly in a society where coordination and reaction time is at a premium, like it is in our very highly sophisticated technical world. So that's why we have those kinds of things. We do have free will, but we have a system where we need to get rid of video lag in order to make a nice system. So that's a thing to that. But I do want to get back here before we get too far astray, although I don't mind kind of jumping around because that's sort of what we got here. I understand that's a sad saying. Um, anyway, you were talking about the, um, the um, terminology that really comes with the double slit and with quantum mechanics, which says that you collapse the wave. Okay, now, first of all, that is a metaphor and there really isn't any wave that collapses. But we say that because that makes sense to us. And it isn't a real physical wave, it's a probability wave. It's only a calculation. There is no physical wave in the wave function in quantum mechanics. A wave means something's oscillating, right? Going up and down, in and out, back and forth. That's a wave. Something's moving. There's nothing moving here. There is no vibration. Vibration is another one of those metaphors. It means things are moving. Vibration is physical. Things moving back and forth. It makes sense in a physical world. In a non-physical world where there's no space, it doesn't make any sense at all. There aren't things moving back and forth. It's just a good metaphor here, and we use it, you know, to mean things, and everybody kind of knows what we mean when we say, oh, I got a good vibe, you know, a good vibration. Well, they kind of know what that means. It has to do with intuition, not that something is really necessarily vibrating or that it has anything at all to do with frequency. It's a metaphor. Same with the collapse of the wave function. It's a probability wave, and we'll get down to it, there actually is no probability wave. That's just a metaphor that helps us explain how reality works. Okay? But what happens then is that there's something new that is going to be generated, something objective, means something with a small amount of uncertainty, See, I'm trying this all back together again. So a small amount of uncertainty is going to happen. Something objective is going to have to happen because we're doing an experiment. An experiment is if I drop a rock, then it's going to hit the floor, right? That's what happens next, it's causality. Well, in this case with double slits, you send particles at these double slits and something's gonna happen on the screen. You're gonna get a particle somewhere on that screen because the ones that go through a slit going to end up on a screen. Now they could end up in the various places, they could pile up behind a slit, or they could end up in a diffraction pattern, but they're going to end up somewhere on that screen. And when they do, you're going to measure it. So that's an event, it has uncertainty, we don't know exactly where it's going to land until it lands, and then we measure it. In that kind of event, there is a probable reality there's the rule set that says what that probable reality is, okay? And when we get down to measuring it, we need a result in this physical reality because probability isn't physical. So it's not really a physical particle. We just think of it that way. It's another metaphor. Okay? It's a potential for a particle. We can't see it. It's an electron or it's a photon. It's very, very, very small. We can't smell it, we can't see it, we can't feel it. So we really don't know where it is. We don't know when it goes through the slit unless we measure it. And when we do, we measure it, and then we've got a result, right? Now we need something physical, objective. It either went through the slit or it didn't. That's a measurement. If we're not measuring it, then we don't measure it until it gets to the screen. And then we need a physical measurement. When you need a physical measurement of something, the way it works is there is this probability distribution of all the possibilities. Okay, so there's many possibilities. With a single slit, whether it went through there, there's only a, it did go or it didn't go. Two possibilities. Well, the rule set tells you 
what the probabilities are for each of the possibilities. And that creates this probability distribution. A probability distribution says, here's 50 things that could happen, and here are the probabilities that each one of them will happen. It's a probability distribution. Now with a double slit, it's, here's two things that could happen, <laughs> you know, yes or no, and one or the other will happen. But there's, it may be a probability of one that it goes through this, you know, that this will happen, say yes, and the no, went through the slit, yes or no. Well, based on the way the rule set and the experiment set up, and it may be a probability of one, that it's gonna be a yes and a zero, that it's a no. Or it could be 50-50. Those are just different probability distributions. Now when you have all the probability distribution of all the possibilities, what actually happens, what they call the wave function being collapsed, is that a random draw is taken from that probability distribution. That doesn't mean that it's randomly drawn from all the possibilities. The random draw from a probability distribution is weighted according to the probabilities. Okay, so the way I think of it, let's say there's, there's five possibilities that could happen. And, and uh, this uh, probability number one is, is let's, we'll talk on a, on a scale of one to 100 because then all our numbers will come out even. We'll say that there's a probability of 90% uh, that the first thing will happen. And there's a probability of 2% that the next thing will happen. Now we're up to 92. Then there's a probability of 3% that the next thing will happen. Now we're up to 95. And then there's 5% that the last thing will happen. Okay, so if all those percentages were, were um, coffee break next, okay. If all those percentages, you can think of them as little pieces of paper that had that number on it. So the 90%, there were 90 little pieces of paper that said thing A, first thing would happen. And then I think the next one was two or three, and there'd be two or three pieces of paper that said thing two could happen and two things, that would, two pieces of paper say that that would happen. And you take all those pieces of paper and you shake them up, that's your probability distribution. You take a random draw, you pick one piece of paper out, and that's what happens, you see. So our reality is really statistical. It's a statistical reality. That's what happens. So now that means 90 of them were that. So it's really likely when I pull a piece of paper out that's got 90 plus you know, two plus two, you know, plus a couple of other small numbers, really it's most likely it's not even get that number one happened, because that's the way it looked up. But I could get the one that only had one piece of paper in there that said it was that fifth thing. I might grab that one, and that's what it would be. Now, all of these things, when I say they're possible, these are all the five possibilities, that means there's enough uncertainty around the answer that any of these five things could happen, could possibly happen. They're all possible. They're just more, more likely or less likely. That's the random draw from the probability distribution. That's the collapse of the wave function. So when something objective is going to be measured, and we don't know what the result's going to be, there's uncertainty. That's how our reality says what it is that's going to happen. It takes a random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities, and that's what you get. Now, once that comes into this reality and we say, okay, we just measured what went through that slot of particle went through that slot this time, and that's it. We can't change that now. It's in this reality as a fact. It's been measured. It's a dot on a screen or it's a blip in a, you know, in a, um, in a database someplace that said particle just went through slit one. Fact. So it was a random draw out of the possibilities, then it becomes a fact. And we call that collapsing the probability distribution. So that's how facts occur here, objective facts. Okay. So if you use your, your intent to modify something, you're changing intent, your, your intent changes probability. So that when uh, that person who has this lump here on their arm under the skin, and they don't know what it is, and you've been spending two or three weeks working on it to make sure that it's benign, raising that probability and therefore lowering the probability that it's not benign, okay? Now, they go to the doctor for the biopsy. You've been working on it now for three weeks. They go to the biopsy, 
and you've just raised the probability of it being benign if you're working from the bean level, if you have good focus in, on your intent. Now, the probability distribution collapses, there's the metaphor, when that biopsy is made, put under the microscope, and they say, ah, benign, or ah, not benign, malignant. That's the measurement. And that comes out of a random draw from the probability distribution. And what you've been doing is weighting that probability distribution in favor of benign. So that there's, you know, 90 benign pieces of paper and there with benign written on them and only 10 with malignant written on them. So that's how all of this ties back into collapsing. So this collapsing of the wave function is a metaphor for this process of taking random draws from distributions to create a physical event that then is a fact of this physical reality. Once a fact, stays a fact. So that's kind of how that works, and that's how our mind and modifying probability is associated with collapsing the wave front. So it's not, nothing collapses till the measurement's made. It's the measurement, and in physics, if you Google measurement problem, you'll find that it's a problem because people don't understand how it works. It's a problem because all they know is there's something that they're gonna get, they don't know what, and whether they make the measurement or not, or how they make the measurement, that's when they find out. So reality occurs as it's being measured. Our reality, new things in this reality happen as they're being measured. If they're not measured, well, we don't know what they are. Could be any one of these five things. Those are all possible but we don't know what it is. Then we measure it, we get one, and that's it. You see? Yeah, entanglement's a little different. Entanglement is just a part of the rule set, and the rule set can have if-then statements in it, like any code does, and entanglement means that within the rule set, these two things are connected logically. So it's if that, then this, okay? It's that kind of a thing. So it's just that the rule set does that and actually the collapsing of the wave function, there is no wave function. What happens is that we, we make that up because we like causality. So we want something physical to go from here to here to cause that. We don't wanna say that I make the measurement and whatever the answer is just appears there because that upsets us. It's, you know, we're materialists and that isn't nice. We want it to have a cause. So we make up this non-physical wave, which is just a mathematical thing in probability, and we say that that wave then collapses to a physical particle. Well, that's just the strange, this is just occurs here, but you know, it makes us feel better because now we have a causal path. So we can kind of live with that better. So there really is no probability wave that travels with the answer. There's just a virtual reality that determines whether something's real or not when it's measured. Because until it's measured, we don't know. Okay? Now we measure things just even with our eyes. You know, I mean, when by measuring, I mean it, it's something new that nobody knows what the answer is. So we could take something like this, and the probability of how much that weighs maybe varies quite a bit before anybody measures it. After it's been measured the first time, now it's only gonna vary in the decimal points right around the last couple of points you know, where they measured the first time if their equipment was good. And there's a probability that their equipment isn't good. So maybe they were off by you know, 10 grams or something. Well, that's possible too. There's another probability. You know, are we gonna, what's the probability that the instrumentation was bad? Well, that was maybe one of those you know, 1% or something that you could pull out and then sure enough, it's really different and sure enough, you know, we check it out and the, and the instrumentation wasn't good. So there's lots of possibilities, mostly. So that's how it works and that's kind of the, the connection. The entanglement isn't that this thing knows about that, it's just the rule set says if this, then that. So you do this and this other thing just happens. Um, so it's the same thing with the double slit. I just make a measurement here and either I get a particle or I don't. It's not really that a wave travels from the laser 
let's say it's a photon or from the thing making the electron, travels from there to here and then actually collapses to produce a particle. That's all just feel-good imagination stuff so that we can imagine that there's a causality, uh, that we live in an objective reality with an objective causality. All that happens is that random draw is taken and the system either puts a particle there or it doesn't. No wave function needed. It just puts a, this is a virtual reality. You can put a particle wherever it wants. There's a rule set that says they only can go certain places. So within that rule set and the uncertainty, the random draw, it just puts a particle there and that's the answer. So the wave function is really an imaginary thing. So your intent can not possible. Absolutely. You, your intent modifies this probability distribution. That's how we heal. That's how um, the placebo effect works. That's how the double slit experiment works. You can modify the probability with your intent. That's how the pair labs experiments work, modifying the, those uh, random distributions. That's how everything works. That's how some people make sure that when they get to where they're going, there's a parking space waiting for them, or a grocery cart just sitting in the aisle where they want to buy something, or, or that the weather is nice for their picnic, or you know, on and on. We use our intent, and we've learned that if we put enough oomph from our being level with a focused intent into something, we raise the probability of that happening. Does what? Does matter exist? Oh, physical matter? physical matter? No, physical matter doesn't exist in any fundamental way. It only exists here as information. So picture it this way. This is a virtual reality just like World of Warcraft. Okay, and, and I'm a consciousness, and I'm not this body. I'm some consciousness that's now, you know, telling this, this avatar how to move his lips. Right? I'm the hand up, up the back. I'm the consciousness telling me how to make choices and what to say and how to say it, pulling my sentences together and talking to you folks. Okay, so well, I lost that train of thought. It just left. Train left the station. Tell me what you said again. I said this is Oh, yeah. Matter, you know, yeah, matter, right. So if I'm playing this World of Warcraft game, does my elf really exist? Does my elf really exist? Does the whole World of Warcraft scene really exist? You know, it's got trees and rivers and rocks besides monsters and, and evil things and whatever. It's got all kinds of critters and things in it. Do they exist? Well, it depends on what you mean by that. Yeah, there they are on the screen. I can see them. Well, they exist as a whole bunch of little tiny dots on my screen. I've got 10 million dots on my screen, right? And or whatever it is, or whatever my resolution is on my screen. So let's say I got 10 million little dots on my screen, and every one of them is either I have a number that gives it intensity, a number that gives it color. And there's numbers that say position, which dot? gets that intensity and that color. So that's it, it's got position, color, and intensity. And every one of my dots gets some information. And what I'm looking at, my elf and the rivers and the streams and the rocks, are just little dots of light. That's all they are, they're digital information. And I take all those little dots and I turn them into trees and rivers and rocks and my elf and swords and you know all the other stuff that's in this game. I turn it into all of that. And all it is is a bunch of little dots changing which ones light up at what intensity and what color. That's it. So I'm taking data, digital information data, I'm turning it into a virtual reality. And then you're asking me, does any of that stuff really exist? You see, it's the same question. No, do the rocks and the trees in World of Warcraft, are they, are they mass? Well, I can't measure how much they weigh because that's not the nature of this game. But if I was the elf, I could maybe measure how much they weigh because then I'd be in the game. But for me, consciousness is being outside the game. It's just numbers, it's just information, it's data. It's a data stream I get. So that's all it is for our consciousness. 
all of our free will awareness units, all of our consciousness are just getting a data stream. And they interpret that data stream as this. And is it massy? Well, the consciousness can't go in and measure it, but Avatar can. It can get a virtual scale and take the virtual object and set it on the virtual scale and send some other thing like some calibrated weights on the other side and tell you how much it weighs. But that's all virtual. It's a virtual scale. It's a virtual calibration weights. It's the virtual thing. And it all comes out according to the rule set. So mass is not fundamental. See, remember those questions that physicists don't know? What's mass? What's space? What's time? None of that's fundamental. It's all just, it's a given as part of the rule set. Those are the, those are the initial conditions and the constraints on those initial conditions that create all this. So mass is one of those. And one of the ways that you tell a virtual reality, if you had to say, well, how can I tell that I'm in a virtual reality? One major way you could tell, one major way your elf could tell that he was in a virtual reality is that he'd follow history back, history back, and then at some point, it was just there. And before that, it wasn't. He'd call that the big World of Warcraft bang, I guess, where it just suddenly occurred out of nowhere. You see? That's the nature of a virtual reality. There is no beginning except when a run button is hit, and when a run button is hit, there it is doesn't have anything. See, we said mystical, something just pops out of nothing. Well, that's really an attribute of a virtual reality. It doesn't have to, it goes back so far, and you can only trace it back to, well, there was this little ball of plasma. It was really hot and under a lot of pressure, and at time t equals zero, suddenly the constraints were left off, and it started to expand. And then the rest of it is evolution, you end up with a universe, you end up with solar systems, you end up with planets, you end up with life, you end up with us. The rest of it's just the evolution of their rule set. So no, mass doesn't exist. Space, time, they're only constructs here in this virtual reality. Space is created by saying this is the origin, and here are three orthogonal directions. Each one is perpendicular to the other. We call them X, Y, and Z. That's space. You've just defined it. That's all space is. That's how we define space in our computer simulations. We make a simulation of an airplane flying through the air, like a flight trainer. They have an origin someplace. They define space. That's how you define space. How do you find time? In that simulation, you've got an outer loop that's a time loop. All dynamic simulations that change have an outer loop that's a time loop. Every time you run through the code, you go back, increment delta t one unit, run through the code again. Increment delta t one unit, run through the code again. That's time. Time is every time we increment delta t, time moves forward. You see? It's a simulation. So there is no mass. The only thing that's fundamental is consciousness. Consciousness is fundamental. Everything else is a product of consciousness. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. I got the message and I forgot all about it. We're supposed to take a break, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hold that thought. Yeah. You're talking about controlling our reality and how we can do this out of what what you just finished saying prior to the break. Okay. Okay. I don't see that happening because um, there's not enough people that are acknowledging that we are a controlled uh, people on Earth. We're totally controlled by something off the world. And I don't know if it's what you were saying about consciousness. If it is, we're losing the battle. Yeah. Well, I would. We're losing the battle right now. Okay, I would say that one, we have free will we can make free choices. Now, free will does not mean that you can do anything you want. Free will doesn't mean that, you know, okay, I have free will, I want to be a brain surgeon, so, you know, I can, I can go start working on brains, or I can go to school, 
It doesn't necessarily mean that. There's other things that we can't control, like do I have the money to go to school? Do I have the time to go to school? I may have a wife and six kids and going to school just isn't in my future. So there's other things. Having free will just means that of the choices you have, you get to choose. So you may have in any particular junction where you get to make a choice, then here are your array of choices. You can pick one of those because you have free will. If you're in prison, you can't go home and say hello to mom. You know, you just can't because you're in prison and it's not your time to get out yet. So that's not in your things of choices. Doesn't mean the prisoner doesn't have free will. The prisoner can do certain things. And within his confinement, he has choices that he can make. He has all the personal choices he can make, you know, to be angry, to be, uh, you, know, to, you know, to abuse others, to not, to, do, to go to the library and learn. I mean, there's all sorts of things he can do. And all of those he has free will choice to do. We're like that. Yes, we had advertisers, we have government, we have all kinds of people trying to manipulate us to buy their products, to do their things, to vote for them, to whatever, send them money. Lots and lots of people want to manipulate us, but it's our choice. What we do, we have certain choices, not everything, and we get to pick those choices that we do. We're not controlled um, by we're really not controlled by anybody very much except our own fear. Our own fear is the primary controller of us, not even those other people, not even the governments and the advertisers and the marketing people. They try to influence us, but it's our own fear. How does the marketer make us buy his beer? By telling us that if we buy his beer, we'll be very popular with all the other people. What's he doing? He's working on our fear, you see? That's how he does. Or you use this shampoo, you know, uh, your hair will sparkle and little, little sunshines will come off and all the people will want to be near you. You know, whatever it is, that's, that's working on your fear. So yes, all kinds of people are trying to control us. The politicians, they try to control us by our fear. It's our fear that allows us to be controlled. If we don't have that fear, we're immune to all that kind of control. So it gets down to our fear is a big handle on our back by which anybody that knows what our fear is can reach out and manipulate us very easily. And the more fears we have, the more easily we are manipulated. And that's true no matter what the situation is. But this idea about aliens, I guess what you mean by off-worlders, that is mostly a metaphor for fear that we have. It's not so much an actual thing as it is a fear thing. Uh, that's the way most of the conspiracy theories are. It's not that there aren't any real conspiracies. There are conspiracies. There are all kinds of people ganging up together to see if they can't make us buy Fords instead of Chevrolets, you know, or make us do this or do that or vote for this guy or that. And there are groups of people working very hard to get our attention moved this way and that. So there's these groups of people trying to manipulate us. Sure, they exist. They exist tenfold, you know, different layers of them, they're all over, even in our family, you know. Your parents, even though you're 40 years old, they're still trying to tell you, you know, how it is that you need to grow up. You know, there's always people that want to help you out by getting you to do the right thing, which is whatever it is they'd like you to do. They see that as the right thing. And the fear that you have is the handle by which they do that. So it's the same thing. We tend to blame things. We take our fear, and our fear is almost like, uh, what was the Jungian term for this? Uh, archetypes. We have a cultural mind as well as our own private mind. Our consciousness is connected to everybody else. And when it's connected to everybody else, we have group mind with that group. And, and well, yeah, well, we're all conscious, right? Every being's conscious. All the rabbits and dogs and bumblebees, they're all conscious too, but we're not in their group, so we're not in their group mind. They have their own thing. But if you're a member of IBM, you work for IBM, you've worked for IBM for 20 years. Well, a good sociologist would be able to interview you and tell you that you worked at IBM because there's a certain type of person that comes out of that culture. 
And if you're a member of this religion, then you have part of the archetype of that culture. You see, so whatever group you're part of, when you say, I'm a part of this group, I'm with this group, you become a part of that group consciousness. It affects you. You begin to see the world differently. You begin to realize that if you work at IBM that you need to wear a, you know, a white shirt and a, and a yellow shirt with blue pinstripes just isn't going to do. That just isn't appropriate. You pick up the culture of the groups that you join, any group. Okay, so we as a culture, we as, a, as humans, we have fears. We have fears about being manipulated and controlled. We have fears of the big person and we're the little person. And we then create metaphors for the fears. And when we're out of body, if we want to explore those metaphors, out of body we will see all the spaceships and aliens we want because that's our fear and that's what we connect to. If we otherwise, you know, we will, we will see things and interpret things. Now you say, well, but you know, I was there and I really did see it. Well, what you saw in a virtual reality was a data stream. That's all. You know, it's a virtual reality. It's a virtual spaceship. It's a virtual little green man with pointy ears. It's a virtual tree that they landed next to. You know, you're a virtual body with virtual eyes looking at this thing. All you are is consciousness getting a data stream. You manifest what you fear. So it doesn't mean that it wasn't there. I'm not saying that all these people who had sightings and things that they didn't actually see them. They did. I think very few of them are really just lying, trying to tell a story. Most of them are very sincere. And I would say I believe them when they say this is what I saw, if they're sober people and uh, so on. It's not that they're wrong. It's not that they didn't see it. It's just that what they're seeing is a, an archetype, if you will, that's, a, that's part of the common fear in the land and among people. So again, instead of reading the lines, you have to read between the lines. It's not so much exactly what the content was that they got in their fear or the content of your dream. It has to do with what are the symbols and metaphors? What does it mean? What's the, what's the, the, the message there? So I don't see that we are you know, about to be overrun by aliens or anything else. We have free will. We, um, we can interact with all sorts of things. Are there, other, are there other intelligences out there? Yes, of course there are other intelligences out there. Are there likely to be other intelligence on our planets in this, in this, in this whole uh, universe? Well, maybe, maybe not. There's a good argument either way. You can make an argument that of course there would be. There's so many trillions of them that certainly there's been to be life involved in some other ones. And there's another argument that says, well, not necessarily. It could be here just for us. Well, wouldn't that be a waste of all the rest of the universe? No, it's a virtual reality. All that rest of the universe doesn't exist. It's just a little point of light in the sky. And you get a telescope, you get more little points of light. So you stop looking at the telescope, all those points of lights go away. It's just data in a data stream. How difficult it is to put a point of light in somebody's data stream. Not very hard. So it's not, it's not really a waste of resources to have a whole universe and only us. It's trivial. All the rest of the universe is not more than several points of lights in our data stream. It doesn't take up a whole lot of effort for the computer to put lights in your data stream. So anyway, you can see that that could go you know, either way. Depends on the purpose for this virtual reality and would it serve to have lots of other groups like this doing what we're doing here on other planets here, then why not get 10 or 100 or 1,000 you know, for the price of one? Make it one great big virtual reality. Well, that's a possibility, but if it's just for us, yeah, that's a possibility too. It depends on what the LCS, the larger conscious system, wanted to do. So I don't agree that there are all, that we are controlled, that we don't have free will, that there are these things that are, that are uh, kind of taking us over. I think that is fear talking. And I don't think people are fibbing when they talk about the things they've seen. I think they've really seen them. But this is a virtual reality. The things they see are data in a data stream. They don't necessarily have to be causal. We see a lot of things that are not causal. 
So we are not the part thing. Well, that's the point. All of the most of the most of the things that you do see, and I think an awful lot of the uh, alien sightings and so on, are not in this reality frame, though they appear to be in this reality frame. It's basically data that's coming here for its own purpose, whatever, and that data gets put in our data stream. Doesn't actually, even though you see it and it leaves little dents in the ground, the ground is virtual ground. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a hard thing to do. So the fear, the fear that uh, kind of gets in our species is palpable now. It's all around, lots of frightened people. I mean, just look at the politics going on, you know, it's, it's fear, everything from all sides. What they try to manipulate is fear. If you don't vote for us, the whole thing's gonna go to hell in a handbasket. And so does the other side, and all the sides all say the same thing. And everyone's trying to scare us. And when people are generally frightened, they start manifesting things that are frightening. It's what we do. So whether, you know, I don't even want to get in an argument of, you know, of how real it is, but, you know, if it's data in your mind, that's as real as it gets. It's not like, you know, dreams aren't real. This is the real world and the dreams are something else. Dreams are a virtual reality, just like this one, and not either one of them is more fundamental than the other. So it's not about the reality of it. It's about the value of it. What can we do to respond to that fear? I mean, what's our role? How do we fix it? How do we make it not so scary? Well, if you come to the conclusion there's nothing that you personally can do about it, there's little green men, you know, sneaking around doing things, can you do anything about it? And if the answer is no, then let it go. It's not helpful to put worry and put fear into it because you're just helping those kinds of things manifest, you see. So the best thing to do is just let it go. Now when some little green guy with pointy ears confronts you on your front lawn and needs to use your bathroom or something, now you have a different situation. Now you have to deal with that. Well, deal with that. Deal with that the best way you can. Deal with everything that comes to you the best way you can. If it's not yours to deal with personally, then don't take it personally, just let it go. Don't add fear to the problem, because fear creates fear. And if these people are afraid, then that'll spread to those people, and pretty soon this side of the room will get fearful too, and then we'll all be fearful. Fear is a part of the psyche, right? We're wired to each other. All of us are connected. And anybody in here starts feeling really fearful, we all feel it. We all get it. And if enough of us feel that way, all the rest that even weren't fearful when they came in here will start to be fearful too. That'll be the group mind for this group that we're a part of. And just the opposite. If people in here are full of love and compassion and feel really good and they're happy and positive, well, so will the rest of us. So I don't think there's anything we can actually do about it if it is that way. So there really isn't any reason to add fear to it. And I don't see anything any different going on now than hasn't been going on for a long time. Now, why would some people have experience with aliens? Well, because in a way, that is another wake-up call to people to say, this reality is bigger than you think. It's not just this pat little world of yours. There's something more, something bigger that's beyond just this and just you. So, you know, why do we have uh, you know, why do some people have these experiences? I think a lot of times it's just wake-up calls. It's just, uh, hello, you know, the world's bigger than you thought. Well, you can interpret that in many ways. If you have some kind of visitation or connection or some vision, you know, when you're meditating, you get to interpret that however you want to interpret. Remember we said that? It's all your interpretation. You make that reality. Well, if you see somebody walking around in your yard and, you know, they're green, 
then you may interpret that as being an alien. It may have just been a little green man that was there to, you know, um, <laughs> you know, give you a message about something or other, and it was just all in your data stream, so it's real. But it may not really have been aliens at all, but that's the tag you put to it because that fits the pattern match that you give to it. You know, things in the, things in the larger conscious system that interact with you, they take on all kinds of shapes and forms and sizes and stuff. The old days it was fairies and so forth. Exactly. There's nothing new in this, right? This has been historically it's, demonstrated for centuries. Yeah. So people will see things. It's in their data stream. It doesn't mean those people did not see leprechauns or that they didn't talk with one or that they didn't even get a charm from one, you know, that worked. You know, it's not that you should doubt that those things and that those people are lying or just confused. It very well may happen exactly the way they said, but it's an experience for them and it's nothing for us to get concerned about until it's an experience for us and then we'll deal with it with love. Otherwise, we just work ourselves into this fear thing, and that's not healthy for anybody. So I guess if Donald Trump is real, anything is possible. <laughs> yes. And you, you, were, you were interrupted last time when we, when we were going to take a break, so I want to give you a, a chance. And then we've got to get to this other stuff because we've got some things to do yet. But. Thank you. I, I, I love the way things flow um, because uh, what I wanted to talk about was actually the Trump I'm a partner. Think about the heart of the parents when they're in the heart of the state. Compassion, love, generosity. Mm -hmm. um, that there is this capacity for this appearance to actually um, cause entrainments in the field around us to measure that in the heart of them. And so I'm thinking about what you're talking about um, our evolution is already in the Mm -hmm. I wonder, and I've often thought about this, is the heart seems especially special. Um, and I, I wonder if we can get some metaphor. Um, it's a metaphor. But uh, it is a, a, a conduit and an amplifier of consciousness. Yeah. It's a metaphor. The heart is a muscle with four chambers that goes lub dub, lub dub, lub dub to make the blood go around. Okay, that's just the way that evolved. Now, as we associate that with a message from the heart, right? Uh, I'm dealing with you from the heart. Well, it doesn't have anything to do with that muscle that goes lub dub. It's, we're using the heart as a metaphor for often what I'm calling your being level, you know, the, the, the core of the person. And it's just a metaphor. Had we had different people who started that metaphor decide that it was something else, you know, it could have been our, our spleen or our stomach or uh, some other kind of thing, then we'd be using that metaphor. So that the heart isn't, isn't the key. The heart is just the heart. And yes, it has electromagnetic fields, all muscle tissues does, so do our heads, so does everything that's alive, so does a squirrel, you know, they have electromagnetic fields around those too. And, the electro and it's, a, it's a muscle, a strong muscle, that works incessantly. You know, so it's, it's contracting hard enough to push a fluid all the way through your body through these little pipes. So it's got a pretty good magnetic field, but a strong one because it's the nature of what it does. But all of that magnetic field is all physical stuff. Really, there really is no magnetic field. You can measure the electric potential. What you measure really is a force on a charge. You stick a charge out here and that little charge will move someplace because of this electromagnetic field. Actually, it's not, it's just the rule set. The rule set's one of that if, if then things. So you have fields and they do relate to things and if your intent is to connect them with things, then that field will have that connection, will show that connection. Because there's, there's un no, chakras are metaphors. When light workers put lights on things, and we're going to be light workers here in a minute, we're going to do a little healing. And when you put a light on something, the light is a metaphor. Chakras are metaphors. These are all metaphors, and they're all tools to help us focus our intent. 
and we can use these things as tools, we can even vary the measurements that we get in our fields with our intent. Our intent will change those, which you've probably measured. You know, people are really happy, people are sad, people are glad, people are static. You know, their fields change. Well, you can do that. There's a fair amount of uncertainty there within that field, and we can change them around with our intent within limits of, of what's possible, just like we can move random numbers within limits of the uncertainty. Well, it's the same with those fields. So those fields can be a, a tool, a measurement tool for mental states, for attitudes, for all kinds of things. So it's not that there isn't a connection there, but the heart's a metaphor for the core center of our of our being, you know, and that's a good metaphor. You need some kind of metaphor for that. The chakras are very good metaphors because trying to give people very esoteric information about connecting to all these various spiritual and non-physical different kinds of energy and things, blah, 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 it's so helpful to put that in their body because they relate to their body, right, more than they relate to anything else. So we'll put the chakras above the head, you know, at the head and the neck and here. And, We'll put our seven chakras at these kind of juncture places in our body, and then we'll make this relationship. Now, people can take that model and use it to, to focus their intent. Oh, they want to gain more whatever? Well, let's work on this chakra because that's the one that does. So now they're going to have their intent to improve in this area. It has nothing to do with the chakra. The chakra is just a tool to help them focus their mind on improving in that area and they want to understand things better, well, the chakra takes all the information and categorizes it. So it takes all these kind of folders that this, this kind of stuff all relates, so we'll put that all in here. So we end up then with seven different categorizations. Okay, so we, we, we fasten that to seven different places in the body just because that's handy, because we're physical things. We, we can relate to it like that with our body. And we do this with all sorts of things. We use tools. The tools aren't bad. When I say it's, it's, when I say it's just a metaphor, it isn't a put down. It's, it's to say that it's a tool that works. And well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about tools here with the healing, and there's lots of tools that you can use that work, and you can use them both ways. The tool can be something that, that changes according to the information you want, like the ladies who read tea leaves, okay? They have intentions, and their intentions are to get certain information, and those tea leaves can sort themselves out in a way that means something to them. And how could tea leaves do that? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty where those tea leaves might land. Easiest thing in the world to manipulate, you see? So it's that sort of thing. The, what, the only active ingredient here is consciousness and an intent. Everything else is tools, metaphors, which we need. Because we as humans can't just be given a whole bunch of esoteric data and make any sense out of it. We just walk away from it. But if we're given tools that let us see that data in certain constructions like chakras, that helps us then deal with that information it helps us focus our intent. So if we want to use a light beam to heal somebody, that's our intent given causation, the light, to fix that spot. Because we believe, because we're physical beings down here, we believe that if we don't actually do something to the spot, we couldn't affect it. So we need to do something to it. You say, it's just our intent. But our intent, if you, if you said, well, it's just your intent, just, you don't have to do anything to it. Just, wouldn't work because we don't believe that at a deep level you know at our being level we believe that if you don't do something nothing's going to happen so that light beam then allows us to have that focus where we can feel effective you see so in a way it's just mind games it's mind games we play with ourselves in order to get something done with our intent to focus that intent and we can use it either way, like the tea leaves or the, or the, or the math, heart math. We can make it be a, um, an output format that we can measure, like we look at the tea leaves and we measure where they are. We throw the bones on the floor, I guess, if we're you know, primitive uh, people and we see how they scatter. 
It can be a measurement back to us, or it can be something, a structure that we use to focus our intent to do something. And in the healing, there's just tons of these, these metaphors that uh, we use to help focus our intent that we just otherwise couldn't do without. So the tools are useful, but that doesn't make them fundamental. And I say they're just metaphors. The just doesn't mean they're not important, that they don't work, or that we don't need them. All of those things are true. We do need them. They do work. They are helpful to us, but they're not fundamental. Consciousness is the only thing that's fundamental. Everything else is a structure that we build to help us understand something. So you can understand things through all sorts of structures. So yeah, there's a chakra structure. There's a heart mass structure. There's a... Um, uh, what are the people? Um, uh, Reiki. There's a Reiki structure with their symbols and their things that they do. You see, it's different. It's just all different structures. And that's good because there's all different kinds of people. And each group of people can relate better to their own structures. And so lots of tools are good. It's not these tools are better than those tools. These tools fit those people better, you know, fit those people better then they would fit these people, and these people, their tools fit them better. So the, the only trap here is that you start to believe that your tools are fundamental, and then the worst step is to believe that your tools are sacred. And then you're willing to fight other people about your tools, and the tools are just tools. The only thing in our reality that is fundamental is consciousness, and we're a part of that consciousness. So our being is fundamental or as this other person calls it, our soul, is fundamental. Okay? But everything else is how we slice and dice the information so that it makes it easier for us to work with it as an output format or as a, something to help us focus, either, either way. And for some people, that's very difficult for me to say because they have so much invested in the tool and in the, the primary significance of that tool that when they hear that, it just kind of blows their world apart and it's not the same anymore because the tool was real and now it's just a metaphor. Well, that's just looking at it the wrong way. The metaphor is just as real. This is just, this, this is just you know, ones and zeros, but it's real to us. Reality doesn't get any realer than this. A virtual reality is as real as reality gets. It's experiential reality. We're experiencing. That's real. So the just is not perjurative. It doesn't mean that it's not important or whatever. It just means that it's not a fundamental thing in this reality. It's a tool. It's a contrived thing. It's construction that we humans find useful for all sorts of things. So heart math is a very useful thing because they're making connections between what's in our minds and you know, what they're measuring. Okay? But then we often take our tools and we make more of them and more of them than, more of them than is really there. We start putting beliefs into them. And then we have a belief structure built up around our tools. You know, the ice cubes that Professor Emoto freezes that are either pretty or ugly isn't because the ice or the water that becomes the ice likes Beethoven and hates acid rock. It's because Dr. Emoto and his staff like Beethoven and hate acid rock. And their intent modifies the way some highly um, uncertain ways that ice crystals form. It's like no two snowflakes are the same. That's because the way water freezes is just very unique. There's like billions and trillions of ways that water can crystallize and freeze. So they're all different. So if you have an intention that that's gonna freeze pretty because you're playing pretty music, it'll freeze pretty because you've just modified the probability because it was kind of 50-50 anyway how it would freeze. Didn't need a lot of modification to be more likely to do pretty. There's so much uncertainty with it. So you see, but then we can come into all kinds of beliefs with the water. Now the water has a preference in music. Oh, now what does that mean? Water with a preference to music and then water's conscious. And then, you know, so we can build these belief systems up around our tools and then they become limitations because we have a hard time seeing the world any other way. And so the good news about tools is they work. 
We need them. We can't heal without that light beam. Okay? The, the bad news is we start to build up belief systems around them and now we start to limit ourselves in the way we see things because we're only looking through the lens of this belief system that's built up around the tool. But we think the beliefs must be true because that's the only way we can explain how the tool works. We don't realize the tool really isn't working. We're working with our consciousness. The tool is helping us work. You see, it isn't the, it isn't the fact that those chicken bones laid on the ground just that way. It's, it's, it's uh, the fact that it's the intent. It's a message. It's a way of producing a message. Or it's not the fact that the light beam dissolved all that black stuff. It's our message that that black bad stuff needs to go away. That's the intent. It's not the light beam that heals. It's the intention that heals. People who feel powerless will get somebody else to do the healing for them. They become the conduit. They have entities that are powerful and they say, dear entity that's powerful, would you heal this person? And the entity heals that person because they don't have the power to do that kind of thing and they just get in the way and their intellect jammering all the time. So they get somebody else to do the work. It's just another tool, you see, because if they did it, they'd say, see, that's not going to work. I'm no healer. I don't know how to do any of this stuff. Well, then it won't work. But hey, this guy knows. So all I have to do is get out of the way and get him to do it. It's still their intent to heal is the active ingredient. That's a tool to help them do that and get out of the way. Because as long as they're not in there yammering, then they're not messing it up. So that's, the, that's kind of the bigger picture of all that. And now we're going we're gonna to do a couple of exercises. Yeah, this is part of this is the fun part. Anybody need a, does anyone need a pen or a sheet? Or a sheet? So we're going to do, we're going to do two healing events and Three remote viewing events, okay? Remote viewing targets. All right. <laughs> and now this is part of the reason we do this. There's two reasons to do this. One is I tell people all the time, it's not your truth until it's your experience. Okay, if, if you haven't experienced it, then it's not yours. You can choose to believe somebody else. So if you say, oh, well, Tom Campbell's been with Bob Monroe for all the time, he's done all this stuff, I'll believe what he tells me. Well, that's just a belief. That's not going to change you at the being level. You're just believing that. That's at the intellectual level. Even if you really, really believe it, that's not so helpful. If it's not your experience, then you can only believe it or not believe it. So it, to be your truth, it needs to be your experience. You have to experience it. Then it's real for you and then it can affect you, you see? So if I tell people that it's not your truth of it in your experience, then I need to give them some ways to get experience. And the easiest way I know of is healing, and the next easiest way I know is remote viewing. None of these take a whole lot of talent or even a whole lot of, you don't have to be born with a gift or anything like that. You're a human being, you're conscious. Your consciousness does this stuff all the time. You just have to learn the hard part, which is to get out of the way to stop getting in the way and messing it up. That's what you really have to learn. That's what's hard. Doing it is your, you know, it, it's kind of your birthright, your consciousness. You do this sort of thing. Getting in the way of it is what you've learned. So now I'm going to talk about healing for just a little bit. When, when, how much time we have? We're going to 430. Um, please remember, if you have to leave, you're not quite finished to bring your sheets back tomorrow because they won't be enough. So it's simply so more experience tomorrow. Um, and if you do need to leave and you're not quite done, please feel free to do that. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to say something. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about dinner meals when we join us. Okay.
So healing, uh, we've got, um, it's getting close to 1600, so we got to move on through this, don't we? Yeah, I think there's Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to heal some people who have some medical problems. First, we're going to diagnose them before we try to heal them. Diagnosing is the evidential part. Diagnosing is where you get your feedback from. Okay, because you either get it right or you don't. So that's good for feedback. Healing, well, they may have gotten better anyway. You see, you don't have the, that, either you helped them or you didn't. You think, well, we worked on them and then they got better right afterwards. So that's kind of probable that maybe we did something, but maybe they would have just gotten better anyway. You see, you don't know unless you heal 100 people or 1,000 people and then you're saying that every time I heal somebody, or most of the time, they get better right afterwards. And if I don't, they don't get right better. You know, they don't get better right after. Therefore, now the statistics start to build up in your favor. So you only get really knowledge about healing from statistics, from healing a lot of people and seeing the effect you have overall. But from diagnosis, you'll get a, we'll get immediate feedback tonight whether you, whether you get it right or not. So that's a good tool to learn. Now these things take time to learn, and if the reason they take time is because you have to get out of the way and just let your consciousness work, and that's very difficult for people, most difficult for left-brainers who don't know how to get out of the way because they live out of this intellect, they define their reality out of the intellect, and they don't know how to make it sit down and turn off. It's constantly analyzing and jabbering. So those are the people that have the hardest time with it, but they can do it too, they just need to practice. Now, um, anybody here that would need a little advice on how to go about healing, about uh, how would they start or approach the problem or anything like that, I can do that uh, quickly if they want some help. Yes. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Well, very quickly, healing has to do with your intent and you can use tools. The typical tool that's used is that you take a beam of light of some sort and you shine it on what you find to be the problem. Now, how do you diagnose and know what the problem is? What we do is we just imagine. Use your imagination. Imagination is a very powerful tool. Remember, that's consciousness too. Your imagination isn't some fake things, just like your dream reality isn't some <coughs> fake reality and this is the real one. Your imagination isn't some fake construct and, you know, and uh, this is the real one. Your imagination is a powerful tool. It can help you focus your intent. It's a tool for focusing intent often. So we imagine something that looks like a humanoid outline. I often say, think of a, a gingerbread cookie. You know, it's not a lot of detail. You don't need to have, you know, shoestrings on the shoes and, you know, uh, dimples and, and, you know, pores on the skin, that kind of thing is just not worth the effort. You just want something that kind of has a head-like shape and a neck-like shape and shoulders and arms and a body and legs and feet. That's good enough. A humanoid outline. And then I say, well, let that humanoid outline, or maybe a paper doll cut out. Think of it that way. Gingerbread cookie, paper doll put out. Uh, I think here we're going to, uh, some people talk about putting an image on a, on a blackboard. Any way you want to imagine it is fine. Just imagine some white humanoid outline, and then in your mind you have an intent, number one intent. Everything that's healthy and good in this, well, back up, number one intent, this humanoid outline is going to represent, is going to be the symbol, the metaphor for the health of I'll tell you a name, Susie Q, say. So this humanoid outline represents the health of Susie Q, tent number one. Tent number two, everything in this humanoid outline that is good and healthy, let it remain white. Everything that is not good or healthy, let it be dark. Now, the darker it is, the more unhealthy it is. So something that was going to be, say, a fatal thing would be coal pitch black. Something that was like the flu would be kind of gray all over, you see, because the flu is systemic, it's all over your body. Uh, something that would be, you know, might be isolated. So you may see something that's just a black spot and maybe just a dark gray spot or a light gray spot or like a puffy gray cloud, but you want 
the things that are most bad health, the poorest health, the most risks to be black. And from then on, you go through black, through all the grays, up until not a health problem at all, that's white. That's, your, that's an intent. Remember, we intended that it represent the health body of some individual I'm going to give you a name of, and then you intend that black is unhealthy, white is healthy. I could just as easily have said it the other way around. I could have made it red and blue. It's just a tool. Okay? And we can talk later, if you like, about colors and different kinds of colors and sometimes actually black being healthy and white being not is a better choice for certain kinds of things. So there's nothing magic about black and white. It's just good to say that black is bad because you know black hats are the bad guys and the white hats are the good guys. So we kind of internalize that white and black that way anyway. So it kind of goes along with our beliefs and cultural symbols. So that's it. Now when we heal what we want to do is get rid of the black and leave the whole thing white. And the whiter the better. The more iridescent glowing the better. If you've ever looked inside a, a, a blast furnace at a smelter that's got the molten uh, steel in it, it's just white to the point that you need glasses to cover your face or it starts to get unbearable. That's how white we want it to get. So you use your intent to make that humanoid shapes, black things go away. Okay, all of this is a metaphor. What you're doing is you're telling your mind to have the intent that the black things that represent ill health go away. We don't want any black in there. All we want is good health, the white stuff. Now you can use the white beam of light. You can use a laser. You can use a blowtorch. You can put acid on it. You can take a knife and cut it out. You can use scissors. You know, you can use magic wands, you can bring fairy dust on it, anything you like, as long as it helps you focus on the result, which is all white and no black. And you do that from the being level where you really intend it to be that way. You're not making a wish, you are intending to change something and you have the power to change it. And a bunch of us together have a lot of power to change it. So that's what you're doing. You're using the tools. Don't second guess. Don't say, am I doing this right? Oh, that's not too humanoid. You know, that's, I can't quite get that human shape right because I don't really can't see the feet very well. Let all that go. In as much as you have to fuss over the details, you're getting in the way. It needs to be something that just flows and you let it flow and you don't try to constrain it. You don't kind of make it do anything other than you want to change the, the, the black stuff to white stuff. That's the key. So that's all really there is to healing. And we can talk later if you want to know about all different kinds of tool sets that you can use, different ways to approach it, and that kind of thing. But for now, that's probably enough because we just don't have a whole lot of time. So that's how you heal. And you can do this on anybody else. You don't need a hank of hair. You don't need a picture. They don't need to be within 100 you know, feet of you or something. They can be on the other side of the planet. And you do need some address of who it is. You have to know. Now, you can have a good address by relaying through people who do know. So in this case, you know, if I give you a, a name of Suzy Q, and if I know who Suzy Q is, and I know the problem Suzy Q has, or I know that somebody else knows who Suzy Q is, then in your mind, if you're going to focus, let this thing be the, right, be the health aura or represent the health of Suzy Q. Not just any Suzy Q. There may be 3,000 Suzy Qs on this planet. You have to do the Suzy Q that I'm talking about here in this experiment. That's the Suzy Q we need. And I could just as easily have called her Miss X. If I know who Miss X is, or somebody else does, or somebody that somebody else knows does, if there's a link here, and there has to be a link because somehow this got in our hands, right? So there is a link here. So you just have to intend that it's this person. So the names aren't important. It's just that, that Suzy Q that I'm talking about as part of this experiment. That's the Suzy Q who I want this gingerbread cookie or this paper doll to represent there 
health. Okay. So now what you're going to try to do is, is just look at, the, look at where the spots are and put them on the map here so you can remember what, the, what it looked like. And it may not be spots. It may be a cloud. It may be on their toenails. It could be on the top of their head. It could be anywhere. If you can't see the whole gingerbread cookie at once, scan it. Take a little window and scan down long. You can do that too. It's easier to just do the whole thing at once, but whatever suits you. It's a metaphor. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's what we're going to do, and we're going to heal these two people. And then we're going to do remote viewing. So we're going to go right into remote viewing. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. That's going to be experiment six and seven. And remote viewing, the important thing is to not guess. The important thing is to not try to figure it out. Don't see a shape and say, well, what is that? Is that a cookie cutter? Is that a you know, football? What is that shape? And you start processing on it, you get in the way. You just need to open yourself up and say, I'd like to you know, get an image of this remote viewing target. And it doesn't matter where it is, who's got it. Could be a picture hanging on a wall. Could be uh, you know, under this table. You know, it's hard to say. It doesn't matter. Just wherever. It's this remote viewing target and you just want to get some image of it, something that tells you what it is. Okay, now, the first thing that comes into your mind, that's like the first two-tenths of a second, that first little flash, that's probably the right answer. The answers you get after that are probably you trying to figure out what that little flash meant. And don't say, well, I got this happy face. <laughs> that's ridiculous. I must have made that up. Let's see, let me try again, you see. Now you're second guessing. Now you're doing analysis on a result. Don't do that either. But you can say, try it again. All right, let me just try it again. And if you can just be entirely open, no expectations, just, I'd like to see an image of this. I'd like to get some measure of it. Okay, that works. Now, if you want to get more specific, you could say, I'd like to see it wherever it is. Or you could say, I'd like to hear it when Beth tells us later what it is. She's going to tell you what it is. And you can say, well, let me just get that. Let me uh, you know, hear Beth telling me what it is. Maybe you're auditory and you're not visual. Or I want to get a feel for it. Whatever it is, write it down here, even if it's a feeling. You know, maybe your feeling is it hurts. Well, if that's your feeling you get, then put that down. Now, what we have difficulty with is it's hard to be quiet in our mind when we just have been open. Because as soon as we let go of everything and we're not yammering, 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 all kinds of stuff comes into our head. And particularly if we have some kind of performance anxiety about getting the right answer. Your head will instantly fill up full of <laughs> images of everything just because you don't want them to. And you're trying to pick something out. So the hardest part is just letting it happen. Don't force it, just let it happen. And the second thing is no performance anxiety. It's okay, whatever you get is just fine. You can try this again, you know, a hundred times. Don't expect to be brilliant on your first try, although often first tries are best because you haven't gotten any, uh, you don't feel like, you don't feel like that, the, oh gee, I got those right, now I better really try, and then that messes it all up. So beginner's luck means the beginner doesn't have a dog in a fight, so he doesn't really care, so he's relaxed and he gets, he gets the image. So that's about all the things that I can try to prepare you for. Now I know I've probably just made it worse because you've got all these ideas in your head now that you're thinking what it is you're not supposed to do, which will make you do it <laughs> automatically. You know? Children are like that too. Tell them, stay away from that cookie jar and you know, the, you know they're going for that cookie jar. So in any case, this is just a trial. You can do these things on your own. So it's easy to find people with health problems. Not that you find them, Get work with a, per, uh, a person. I'll, I'll find three people with health problems and you find three people and then you give me yours and I'll give you mine and then we'll switch and we'll see if we got it right. See, it's easy to do. If you practice this, if you practice this, you know, what, 10 times a week, then three months, you'll be good at it. It's not hard to heal people. Okay. So I'm going to let you get in a little relaxed state where your mind is, is uh, 
at rest, take a couple of deep breaths if you want, whatever you do, slip into a meditation state or just close your eyes and be open. Be entirely open and Okay, the first, the first person that we're going to uh, diagnose and then heal. First we're going to diagnose and I'll get you to write that down. Then we're going to heal and I'll get you to write that, I'll get you to uh, uh, remember that. You won't write that down. You're only going to write down your diagnosis, okay? So first, Michael C. Okay, Michael C. See a humanoid figure that represents Michael C. Let it be white. Let the white be good. And the dark be black. And then ask to see where the black spots will be or the black clouds or whatever. Just ask. Okay, come back and write down what you've seen on your experiment one sheet. Turn to viewing the health body of Michael C. and heal whatever you find there that is not healthy.
Okay, now let the image of Michael C.'s health body fade. Let that go and just return to rest in the void for just a moment. Okay, we're going to start experiment two. Imagine a humanoid outline and let this humanoid outline represent the health body of Hilda P. Let this white humanoid outline represent the health body of Hilda P and proceed to diagnose that health body. What is white is healthy, what is dark is unhealthy. Now describe what you have seen on the experiment two page. Draw in where you saw the dark spots. And then proceed to heal Hilda P. You know, let that image of Hilda P's health energy body go and continue to float in the void.
The next experiment is experiment three, and this is a remote viewing object. There is an object that's been designated as experiment three. Look and see what this object is. Now return and draw in the box for experiment three on your third page what you saw. As soon as you are done, go back to floating in the void. Next, experiment four is also a remote viewing target. There is something that is designated as experiment four. Take a look and see what you see. Oh. We're now going on to experiment four. So there, it's a remote viewing target. Take a look and see what it is. Okay, return and draw what you have seen. Experiment four. The last experiment is also a remote viewing experiment. That is experiment five. Experiment five is an object that has been de designated as experiment five for this exercise. Go see what it is.
And return now and write down what you saw. Experiment five. And then if you've written it down, bring yourself all the way back and we will find out what these things are. Okay, Beth, would you tell us about Michael C., what they might have seen? Um, if you saw uh, kind of a black spot in the area of the pancreas, Sorry, um, Michael has pancreatic cancer, so if you saw a black spot in the area of that part of the body, then that would be accurate. Okay, now you may make left and right errors because I didn't take the time to tell you that you need to specify whether this, this white uh, image is looking at you, you're looking at its face, or it's looking away from you, you're looking at its back, and that'll switch right and left. And that's one of the intents. I let that go because it seems like it was already too much. So I didn't want to overload you on, on this. So that's, if you got things right and back, reversed, that's because you didn't know to make that as part of your intent that you knew what side you were looking at because one's right, one's back, and sometimes when you don't have an intent but there's a piece of information you need to know, you'll just get a random. It's got equally likely to be front or back. So then it's kind of random whether you get the right side, left or right. Okay, uh, next, would you tell us about Hilda? As uh, so the worst of it would be right shoulder and arm, but maybe some gray and the rest of the bones. All right. And experiment three is a Queen's Guard soldier. So if you've got the fluffy hat or... Oh. <laughs> there you go. And you know why you got that? Because I said it was an object. Right? Yeah. And then I got the vertical, vertical line. That's what she got to Yeah. 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 Experiment four was a tomato with a fork lying underneath of it. So if you got the round object, or we call it red. Yeah. And experiment five is, is like a castle with lots of trees. Is that water in front of the You know, it looks, look at this, the shape of the building. It could very well be a wine glass. Here, look. Okay, now when you when you remote view, you often will just pick up architectural characteristics. Okay, so um, you know, you see a water tower that's maybe a little structure and a and a big circle on top of it, you might think that's a, a golf ball on a tee or you know something else. So you don't necessarily have to get the object right as you should hopefully be picking up some elements, some architectural or drawing elements of that, of that thing. Yeah, so it's been a lot of fun. We've got more of these to do tomorrow. But I, part of the reason that I outlined a lot of what was going on in the structure and, and, and the intents involved was that when you had the experience, you could experience yourself and your, your intellect getting in the way you could experience the second guessing. You could experience uh, the fact that, uh, that you didn't actually take the first thing that came into your mind, that you kind of rejected that and you looked for something better, even though you don't know what it is. You just know that that really wasn't much. So, you know, all these things, you can probably now appreciate that that's what happens and that's what, the, that's what gets in the way and that's what you have to practice. And real re remote viewers, I say real remote viewers, remote viewers who do this 
sometimes for a living, um, they have tools that they use to make it harder for them to second guess. So they'll be double and triple blind. You see, they'll be coordinates someplace and somebody made up the coordinates who put them in an envelope and then there's a hundred envelopes. They all get shuffled. Somebody else picked one and hands the envelope to somebody else who holds the envelope sealed and says, tell me where this is. What do you see at these coordinates? Nobody gives the envelope to the remote viewer. See, now the remote viewer has no idea whatsoever, not even a hint. All he knows is that they're coordinates. So it's someplace on the planet. That's his only hint. Well, that helps him. Doesn't hurt him. It helps him because nobody else in that room knows either. Even the person that nobody knows. You know, there isn't anyone that has any idea what it is. So there's no noise that he can pick up from anybody else. It just makes it easier for him to, to work that way. And I, I'm, this one fellow, he got a box for that first one. Well, the piece of paper was a box. And I said, it's an object. Well, if you're looking for an object, you're looking for a shape. Sure enough, <laughs> it was a rectangular shape, you see. So that's, you know, that's a hit. That's good. A triangle wouldn't have worked. Would have been the wrong shape. So you have to look and see where you get pieces of it, because most of us aren't going to get photographic images, you know, at high res. We're just going to get pieces of that image, and the pieces will get more whole as you go on and practice. So any little piece of it, that's the thing. You know, a lot of times you have stuff that's, uh, that's round, and people will see an apple or a clock or all sorts of things that kind of have that round. Well, they got the sense of the stem maybe in the round, and it uh, could have been an apple, could have been a clock, you know, could have been something else, could have been a ball on a string. So all of those things are really right answers. Well, that's it. We have had a lot of fun. We've had a lot of really great questions, and we get to do it all again tomorrow. So if you didn't get your question answered, then uh, we'll uh, do it tomorrow. Thank you.